I'm Dr. Matthew Barr. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow based in the School of Computing Science. And in this short lecture, I'm going to talk about how playing video games can affect players. And I'm actually going to focus on some of the positive effects that playing games can have. Often we see reports of the alleged negative effects that games can have on players. But in fact, the evidence for those negative effects is very weak. In fact, there's quite a lot of research that is looking at the positive impacts of playing games. So one of the big areas in which games are said to have a positive effect is in learning. Game-based learning is a well-researched topic, and one of the biggest names in game-based learning is James Paul G. He's a professor at Arizona State University, and he has identified 36 learning principles from observing how people learn from playing games, mastering new games, figuring out how they work. So these principles include things like what he calls the psychosocial moratorium principle. And all that means is that whenever you play a game, the consequences in the real world are lowered. You can experiment, it's a safe place to fail if you like. There's also the active and critical learning principle, which says that learning is set up inside games to be active rather than passive. So those are all good hallmarks of learning, and that's why game-based learning is of such interest. Another important name in game-based learning is Dr. Kurt Squire, who, whenever he was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, did his doctorate in teaching history using game civilization. So Kurt actually got a classroom of students, not necessarily the top flight students, these, some of these guys had failed the course in the past, but he got them to play civilization in the classroom. And while there was some initial resistance from some of the students in the room, eventually it actually worked very well. Kurt's students began to understand history as a complex system, a series of interrelating factors, and they developed problem-solving skills along the way. In the end, a large proportion of Kurt's class were able to discuss these factors. They were able to discuss their strategies, the pros and cons, the strengths and weaknesses of various civilizations. And they began to develop quite a sophisticated understanding of civilization, the game, as a system. They even identified things like bias in the way that the game was coded. So these are sophisticated ideas that are not about learning facts and figures, but about applying critical thinking, solving problems, and adapting to ever-changing circumstances. And it's these kinds of skills, these transferable skills, that games are particularly good at developing in players. And that's what we looked at in Glasgow. We did some work to explore how playing certain video games might develop our skills in communication, our adaptability, and our resourcefulness. So we recruited 100 undergraduate students and randomly assigned them to one of two groups, an intervention group that would play selective video games over a semester and a control group that would not play the games. We tested both groups at the start of the semester and again at the end of the semester to measure their communication skill, resourcefulness and adaptability. The game playing intervention group was asked to come and play video games in our games lab. The games lab was set up just like any other facility on the university campus on a drop-in basis. Students could come in and play games in between their lectures. Each student was asked to clock about two hours of play on a series of games, totaling 14 hours of gameplay. At the end of the semester, because we had measured both the control group and the intervention group's attainment of these skills, we were able to make comparisons. The average score change was significantly more positive in the intervention group that played the games versus the control group. The control group, their skills didn't really change at all. If anything, there were slightly negative trends in their skills attainment over the semester. You can take a look at the paper to see the facts and figures and the results in detail, but the results do support the idea that playing these video games under these conditions could help develop our students' skills. Another active area of games research, and again, something we've done a little bit of work here on in Glasgow, is the relationship between playing games and players' well-being. Games have been found to be effective in developing skills, as we've already seen, but there's also evidence to suggest that games can be used to help treat trauma or to combat loneliness or to improve player well-being. In our study, we looked at how games help players cope with lockdown during the COVID-19 pandemic. There was a lot of anecdotal evidence floating around at the time that people were turning to games to help cope with lockdown. And we wanted to understand what was really going on there. So in order to do that, we surveyed nearly 800 players and we asked them how their game playing habits had changed, why they had changed, and most importantly, if playing games had affected their well-being. 
whether positively or negatively. We then took those results and we analyzed them using what we call inductive thematic analysis. That simply means going through the text of the responses and categorizing what people have said. And that allows us to draw out the main themes of their responses. The overwhelming response was positive. People were very positive about the effects that playing games had had on their well-being during COVID. Whenever we analyze the results, we found a total of seven different themes or seven different reasons why people felt that games had improved their well-being. These included topics such as their mental health, stress relief, cognitive stimulation, socialization, and normalization. So I'll give you a couple of examples. In terms of mental health, a lot of our respondents talked about how playing games help reduce their anxiety and generally just improve their mood. It wasn't a fun time for many people and games allowed people to have a little bit of fun. Now games potentially positive effects on mental health are already well documented and we can look to the psychology literature to help understand what's at play here. One theory that's useful in describing what's going on here is Csikszentmihalyi's theory of flow. Flow is that optimal mental state that we get into, sometimes referred to as being in the zone. And being in a flow state comes from us being just challenged enough by a task not to feel frustrated. Okay, so it's making sure that a task isn't so difficult that it's frustrating and we give up, but it's, it's not so easy that it's boring. And so games are actually designed to induce this flow state. They're actually designed to improve our mood. So that's one way that we can help explain what's going on here in terms of how games helped improve people's mental health. Now, if we think back to lockdown, a lot of us were unable to go to work to feel productive. And we certainly didn't feel in control of our lives because we couldn't go out and do the things that we would normally do. That meant we had a lack of agency. We didn't feel that we were autonomous. We didn't feel like we were in control. And it turns out that playing video games allows us to feel that sense of autonomy, to feel like we're in control because we can play the game on our own terms and we can make progress. We can make a difference within the kind of game world. Player agency is often considered to be one of the main motivations for people to play video games. And as is often the case in human computer interaction, we can again look to the psychology literature to help explain this phenomenon. That's where self-determination theory comes in. According to self-determination theory, competence and autonomy, along with relatedness, are the three kind of pillars, if you like, of human well-being. These are the needs that we need to have met in order to ensure our well-being. And games are very good at addressing all three of these various pillars. Certainly, the self-determination theory helps explain why our participants here connected their well-being with playing video games. The video games are meeting these basic needs that are otherwise not being met during lockdown conditions. And that connects nicely with the final theme I want to look at today, and that is socialization. In fact, the social aspects of games were peppered throughout our data. Lots and lots of our participants talked about how games provided them an opportunity to socialize. And while the social aspects of games are not necessarily at the forefront of the, the public imagination necessarily, games are inherently social. Our participants here talked about, for example, whenever they're playing games online, it was a way of connecting with their friends and their family that they didn't live with. At the same time, people felt connected to a community, even if they were playing online with people they didn't know. And that is the final part of the self-determination theory, that idea of connectedness, being connected, having meaningful connections with other people, with a wider community, or even just with our family and friends. There's other evidence in the literature that it helps explain what's going on here as well. Games have been found to help combat loneliness, as I mentioned before, but they also give us what's called social capital, right? Being able to connect with others, even if it's online, still has a meaningful effect on how we feel about our relationships in real life. So again, this is a void, if you like, that playing video games was filling during lockdown. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick run through of some of the effects that playing games can have on players. If you've enjoyed this topic and would like to find out more, come and study with us at the School of Computing Science at the University of Glasgow.